I was thinking this afternoon, it just came to me, how much I love the Word of God. Hallelujah. It, it, it's life-giving for me, I, I know, and I think for you as well. And, and I, I not only love to study it, I, I, I love to dig into it. I'm, I'm learning more and more about how it, it, it's affiliated with other scriptures and how it hooks up. And, uh, and uh, you, you begin to think about that using your human logic and you say, why would it be otherwise actually? Uh, why would God say something in one part of his book uh, that he doesn't substantiate and, and embolden and enlarge in another part of his book? It doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. And I, and I love seeking these things out, these connectors in there because it does, it builds faith. Uh, and whenever you study the, the older testaments, uh, early covenants, uh, uh, you, it, it really does something a lot for you because you begin to understand then that his prophecy is accurate uh, and, and it shows up again in the New Testament like we call the Old Testament. Uh, and, and it's an enthralling thing because as we step off into this word, I'm going to live by this word, you say. And you say, you begin to, that you can kind of feel the arms of the Lord just wrapping himself around you and just say, I'll take you, son. I'll take care of you. I'll take care of you. I got you back, you know. Daughter, and you know, stay with me. Stay with me, you know, and I'm going to take care of you. And, and, then, and then, then as your faith builds and then you begin to believe the word of God uh, and you say, well, I think I'll just, I, I think I'll just apply that in my life. You know, up to then you might have just been reading stories, but then after a while you began to say, "Hey, you know what? This looks like this is the absolute word of God, Amen. and He knows all things, and He's all powerful." You know, and He graciously sent this word to us here. Why? Just so He wants to establish Himself? No, because He wants to establish us. Hallelujah! He wants to make us such believers in Him that we're one. Hallelujah. That whenever I stand and speak the words of God, it's as though he's speaking the words of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's not an ego trip. That's just a fascinating thing to me that my father loves me so much, he let me speak his word. Amen. When do I do that? Not, when you're, not, not, not just standing up here, but it's when you're out in life, you know. It's when you wake up in the morning and you say, I give you the day. Hallelujah. This is the day you've made, Father. I just give it to you, you know. And you go out and you, and you go your job, you do your thing, whatever it happens to be, and you continually stress that you're speaking the words of God instead of things that are contrary to the word. And, and, and you just see God begin to work in your life. Your life becomes embellished and it becomes more like Him. And the next thing you know, I, I strive for the time to get to the place where when I speak, you just think of God. Not two people, just God. Just him. Is that possible? Yeah, it really is, I think, you know. And I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I know many of you are just as well. So we can not only represent him, but we can be him walking on this earth. Yeah. I love the idea of thinking about, you know what? Jesus is walking around in his dolan body doing his thing. Praise God. Praise God. I like that idea, you know. And that's not an ego thing at all. That's just, that's how powerful he is. This is the only religion that there is where, where, where we are endued with the Spirit of God within us. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. That changes everything. We're not, there's not some dead God that we fashioned and that we look at like we did over in Roman Greece. We just, we, we, uh, over in Turkey, Greece, this uh, God, he's, he's within us. Praise God. And, and that just blew a lot of people's minds and that got Paul thrown out of a lot of places, you know, <laughs> for being that way. But you know, he's pretty adamant about speaking the truth, you know, and, and that began to work for him. Well, we were over there, and as you know, some of us were over there in, uh, in uh, Turkey and Greece, and, uh, and uh, I was really happy about uh, what I discovered over in Ephesus. Uh, uh, he's always been a favorite writer of mine, sometimes because he's so complicated, you know, those inverted sentences he's got, you know, I just love to try to figure them out. But I was also walking along as we I mean, were walking down through those long streets where Ephesus was, that elongated place. And, and you start looking along there and you see, seemed like every third or fourth doorway was, was a false god of some kind. There was a, all kinds of 
false gods here and temples to some uh, this and that and all the time. And I said, that's just like Paul. Boy, he'd be on the front lines. He wouldn't be off somewhere where we wouldn't have any opposition. It seemed like he just showed up wherever it was hottest, you know. And, and he never did seem to back down. Well, I'm going to talk to you tonight about pivot points. And, uh, well, that's a non, <laughs> not an exciting deal. Well, no, it's really not. Uh, I, I, I have learned in my life to pay a, t a whole lot of attention to pivot points. And it's, it's not because I just want to document my mistakes or, you know, some, some, some <laughs> successes. But what I'm doing, by those, I'm looking at those with a thought in mind, hey, that's an advance. That's an advance. Hey, that, that, that's an improvement, you know. It, it didn't look like it maybe at the time, but... Uh, Hey, that's, that's progress, you know, progress. One of the things you have to assume is this idea when you do that, you have to assume that even though you've got a downer in your life, that you're going to learn something out of it that'll keep you from doing it again. Or you, you may do it again, but you're going to learn something else again out of this thing. You know, there's never, it's, it's almost, you begin to think along this line and it's almost impossible to think of a situation that God can't do something better with. You know, and, and there's all kind of, and so what begins to happen, and I'm glad Randy's preaching so much about this, about you're not your past, you know, because everybody's got one of those, you know, you know good or bad. And, and the truth of the matter is, I think we ought to emphasize that, that, you know, we're not our past, we're not our mistakes, and, and we can overcome all those things. So praise God, that's good. But also, I, I think he's been telling me a lot, even my good things, don't think about those too much either. Why not? Because he's a today God. He's a today, today God. He, he is a, he's a today God. Glory be to God. And it's now in the future that he's interested so much in because the past is done. That's why it's called the past. And so what we now do is begin to look at those things. And so these pivot points make, begin to make a lot of difference in your life. So I've, I've done a little work on that. And, um, and, 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 uh, uh, I've run into so much stuff that that, uh, uh, that I'm not going to be able to get to, but I'm thinking about it. And so, what I want to do is, uh, is 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 present you some things. Uh, and I'm I'm not preaching down to you or or say I know this and you don't. I'm just I'm, what I what I like to do is to lay this out for you and let you think about it. I like to I, some if, if somebody can just give me an idea an idea. Well, that's okay. You can quit now. I'll, I'll take it from here and begin to embellish this thing and start looking in Scripture about it. And, and the Holy Spirit just takes it over and here you go. So I'm going to present you some ideas this evening. Um, and they're various kind of, kind of sermons that I just love to preach to you. Uh, but uh, I'm supposed to talk about pivot points tonight. And so I'll begin with just that. The uh, pivot point uh, and the definition that I like to work from is a condition that 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 can um, uh, uh, it's a condition uh, where you are at a pivot point in your life. It's going to be a it's going to be a condition whether you change your direction or or it's going to be a condition where the where the circumstances are have evolved. It's going to be a place where you've reached a boiling point in, uh, in, 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 in your life. It's a point where change is now ready to be made. You've been driving along this way and you reach a pivot point. What that means is now, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to continue on the same way. It also could mean that you're going to change direction absolutely. It also means that you're here with at this point in these conditions, and the conditions may change. Directions stay the same, but the condition may change. It's a pivot point, meaning there's a change in store at this point. It's not the same old, same old any longer. There's that kind of thing. So, so as you look at your life, you'll find those things. I'm sure you will. You'll find those positions. It's like, hey, this is a new day. This is the nude. It's not like any day before. It's a pivot point. It's an opportunity for change. Now, we can take it or not. We can let it go or not. Directions have changed or the conditions have now changed. Uh, it offers new circumstances. It, are, it also offer, off, offers a new opportunity it, uh, to do better or worse. Your choice. Uh, it's a pivot point in your life. It's 
A at this point from henceforth, you've got something to do with it and you can leave it like it is or you can change it. And in some instances, outside forces will force you to change. Yeah. That happens as well. That happens as well. Is that a crisis? No, it's not a crisis. You're in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got the righteousness of God in you. So don't fall apart about some pivot point. I'll say don't fall apart about anything. Is God greater than all these things? Yeah, he is. So, so this is, I'll call it then just an opportunity. It's an opportunity. And, and, and the reason why then it becomes an important thing is because this gives you an opportunity to change your life. You say, okay, this is a new day. I can change today. I've had this routine going on. Uh, forces that have been at work to cause me to take this path, like this path, or that path, or this path, whatever. But now this is a pivot point. This is a new day. And you can look around and you'll discover that you've had those things. There can be pivot points that have absolutely no, no consequence at all. Uh, but I'll tell you what, many of the pivot points in my life I have discovered uh, they didn't have any consequence in my life unless I recognized them. Yes. So there's a sensitivity that you have to have to a pivot point. You, have to, you just can't be numb drum and, and, and not do it. And I think the leadership of the Spirit requires that you're sensitive to these pivot points. I think so. I think so. Because if you're going to take control of the direction of your life under the aegis of God, then you have to be aware of these things. Yeah. Like you got to know where you are before you know where you're going. You know, that kind of thing. So that begins to work in your life too. If you'll please turn to Matthew 9, 22. I want to show you uh, several things. And I'm going to give you lots of scriptures that will help you uh, along this line. And, uh, but the point all the time is to let's be sensitive to our pivot points. Jesus was talking... And he was uh, speaking to people. And, and as he did, there was a ruler who came up to him. And this ruler said, uh, my daughter is now dead. But if you would come and lay hands upon her, she would live. Yeah. And Jesus arose and followed him and so did his disciples. Okay. A woman who was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came up behind him. And she touched the hem of his garment. Now, there's an interesting thing about this. Who is Jesus, the head of the church? Who are we, the body of the church, right? So we're called the body of Christ, right? Well, all through this, this tells us that we have the same anointing that the head has. The, the head cannot have a different level of anointing than his body. Okay. I submit to you that, just to clear up your mind, I submit to you, and I came up with this not too long ago, and, I, and, and some people don't like this, but I, I came up with the idea that everybody who calls himself or itself the body of Christ is not. Why do you say that? Because there's not the fruit that goes along with being the body of Christ. Okay? So, we have to decide that we're going to become the body of Christ. Right. It's not casually done. You don't inherit it. You don't get it because you joined an organization like a church. That doesn't do it. That doesn't do it. There has, there has to be something that you decide that makes you part of the body of Christ. It's an individual thing. We hear that all, this, all the time. It's a personal thing. That's sure. That's all going on very well. But I'll tell you what, this is really getting, going to get serious in just a minute because the body of Christ that has the anointing of the head, of, of the head who is Jesus can affect and infect all kinds of circumstances, if that's really true. It's got to be to the point, I'm telling, I'm telling you, because of all the forces that are against God who are in this world. They're going to lose, but they're against them. And they can cause a lot of chaos, you know. All those things that are going on that are going against the body of Christ now, we have to be able to offset. We cannot go along to get along. And we cannot allow a pivot point of, I just understand that 
I've got the same anointing that Jesus Christ has. Oh, that, that's sacrilegious. No, it's not. Because I'm a, if I'm a body of Christ, it's not. Right. Whose choice is that? Mine. Yours, right? So then, if that's true, then when you walk into a situation, that thing's got to change if it's wrong. That's true? Amen. We're never built as members of the body of Christ to put up with a lot of things that are unscriptural. That's not right. We're put, it, put up to walk into a situation and change that thing. Right. Or the anointing is no good. Right. Well, it's good. Yeah. It's good. And many of us have been able to prove that whenever we walk into a situation or even actually physically into a room, we can change that situation because praise God, the Son of God is here in your body. Crave that, don't you? Don't you? I want that. In fact, I'm wanting it more all the time. I want it to be a force in my life. I don't believe that we ought to put up with a situation where our streets are inundated with a bunch of gangs who break the peace of our area. I don't think we ought to put up with a situation where our neighborhoods are inundated with drugs. I don't. I don't think that's right at all. I don't think we ought to put up with any situation locally or nationally that goes against the Word of God. If, we're do, if we do, we're just playing. We're just playing. Well, I'll tell you what. There have been generations. I, I don't mind saying it. I used to say, well, maybe I shouldn't say that. Uh, there have been generations of people that I've known about who've been in churches who let it go on. And that's why we're in the situation we are now. So what's our job to do? Get this straight now. That we've got the anointing of Jesus Christ on us because we're His body. And then go to work. Amen? So, this lady reached up behind him, and this always bothered Cherry. He reached, she just came up behind him, apparently without his knowledge, because she touched the hem of his garment, and those those tassels on the bottom. And by the way, you get to looking over in the Old Testament, and you'll understand that it says over there that there's healing in the wings, and those tassels are called wings. So she touched the wings of his prayer garment. And when she did, and but she said within herself, if I but touch his garment, I shall be whole. Now, she didn't really have any right to say that. She didn't. She didn't have the authority to. She didn't have the credentials to. But she found a truth that she could work on. Like we are looking, learning the truth tonight that we have got the anointing of God on us because we're Jesus' body. And so Jesus turned him around acted like he was surprised and he saw her and, and, and it says in another I'm in Matthew but it says it again in another place you know he said daughter be of good comfort your faith has made you whole not just healed you made you whole made you whole made you whole and it says here and the woman was made whole from that hour she had her pivot point didn't she why did she have a pivot point? Because she muttered up there to herself, if I but touch his garment, if I can touch the wings of his prayer garment, if I could just do that, she knew something that script said over in the Old Testament, said if I could just do that, I'll be made whole. Pivot point. Just like that. She never forgot it, I'll bet you, just as well. So, so be of good cheer, daughter. Now she's a daughter, you know. Be of good cheer. So that began to work for her. Okay, now look at, look at verse uh, chapter 21 to Matthew and 22, please. Pivot points, pivot points. Talk about pivot points. Please start looking for them. You might analyze your past life and say, that was a pivot point. Boy, that was a bad bit boy. Ooh, that was a good one. Begin to think about those things. Because here's what's going to happen. Let me tell you this. I'll just give you a preview. What's going to happen? There's nothing that works in the kingdom of God without faith. Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't. Don't try to make it work without faith. 
So what do we need to do then? If we're looking, for, if we're looking for, to be blessed by a pivot point, we need to believe for that. We don't need to wait to see if it's going to happen and see how it turns out. The, the, our faith is supposed to be, I need a pivot point and I need it to go this way. Thank you, Father, for it. And begin to praise God for it because what you are doing now, the moment you pray that prayer, you have received it. Really? Yeah, you have received it. And so these pivot points will show up in your life and they have greater impact if you faith for them. Amen. If you faith for them. I was talking earlier about, uh, about, about, about a, 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 a healing situation. And, and, the, and the truth of the matter is, I think we should be living in divine health at all times, but we need to be faithing for it all the time. We need to be faithing for it. Now, I used to not believe that. Or not, I don't know where I believed it or not, but I just waited for things to happen. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to be healthy. I did, when I got sick, I tried to get healed. Well, that's a little late. You know, that's a little bit late, you know. So the thing to do is to believe for divine health now. Amen. And I'll, t I'll tell you what, it's enthralled me about what's happened to me about this, le about this, uh, this heart valve leaking. He said, throw me. I didn't, I was not believing that I had that heart valve get better, but I was believing that I was a righteousness of God in Christ and I was swamping myself with the word. I'd stay in this for seven, eight hours a day. Not that it's about me, but what I'm doing, I'm saying the power of God's in his word. See, and so what happened then, the next thing you know, uh, two doctor trips ago, just uh, habitually uh, routine things. I wasn't going up there for any sickness. Thing. He, uh, he looked at it and, and he wouldn't quite say that this thing, he listened real hard to see if he could find this, this leak, this, this heart valve leak. But he didn't, he didn't comment about it. But the last time he was up there, I mean, he got on the heavy because he'd already looked at the chart from last time. He looked at it a long time and he finally had to announce and it was a difficult thing for him to do. It's not there. Now, heart valves, hallelujah, heart valves don't do that. They, they actually get worse. You know, routine, routine kind of thing. They just, you know, they should get a little worse. He, he just had to admit, and he's a good Baptist guy, and he really is a Christian. And I said, prayer works, doesn't it? Well, he didn't respond to that. <laughs> but he couldn't find any leak. You see what I'm talking about? I'm saying the Word of God. And so what we need to do, I'm saying what we need to do then is, is, is if we haven't begun to do it. Now, you may be already doing this to praise God if you are. And so then you, you'll, be, you'll be reinforced by what I'm saying. But if you don't know anything about it, here's a good night to learn this thing. We can absolutely start documenting our destiny by what we're doing now out of this Word, out of this Word. We, if we accept this word, it starts to do everything the word says it can do for us. You'll end up believing that you're what God says you are. Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. You want to do that? Hallelujah. I want to, yeah, yeah. I want to be who God says I am. Instead of arguing with it all the time. You know what I'm saying? So, so it begins to work this way. So, so this is what happens whenever you, whenever you begin to do it God's way. And of course, that's, that's what we all want to do. And he, he said, if you have faith in, uh, in verse 21 of uh, chapter 21 of Matthew, he said, I'll say unto you, if you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also you shall say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and it shall be done. What? You mean that's a pivot pointable kind of thing? Yeah. And he said, and all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. God told me not long ago, I don't say this very often, but he told me not long ago, he said a lot of people, you know, we've been talking a whole lot about believing and receiving, and, and he told me the other day, about two weeks ago, he said a lot of people are, are, are trying to receive, but they're not believing. Well, it's believe first and receive. You know, that's what you do. You believe first and then you receive. A lot of people want, you know, we're Americans, we want to get on to the goody side real quick, you know. Give me that, give me to the payday. I need that really quick. But he said, believe and receive. Oh, I've got to believe? Yeah, not, you got to believe. Why do you have to believe? you got to believe in the God who supplies all your needs. You don't believe in yourself, you believe what God says. And he said there, and he said, and all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. I'm saying to you, that's your next pivot point. That's your next one. That's not your last one, that's your next one. But you can use it just as well for your next one. So continue to do that. I'm going to believe so I can receive. I'm going to, and then there's other things. Lots of, you have to, uh, Sharon, I know, I know a lady, she absolutely cannot receive a gift. 
She just, she absolutely cannot. So you got to work on that side first. But the first thing to do is believe. And she'll believe, all right. But she won't receive very well. So oh, I look now at Mark 5, 36. We're looking for pivot points. Thirty-five says, While yet he spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter's dead. Why troubles us thou the master any further? And as soon as he heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, and I can just envision him when he heard, the, he heard this going on. They were on their way on another issue, and he, 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 saw, he saw them come up and say to this ruler, he said, Your daughter's already dead. Don't bother her. Jesus don't bother her. And he turned, I, I really believe he turned around, he's just so strong in him. I think he turned around and says, only believe. Believe. Don't listen to that. Don't listen to that. that. That's a circumstance that we don't need in this situation. We've got a child to raise here. So what, what's your job to do? Your job is to believe. I'm going to resurrect him, but I need your belief. So what do we need working in our lives? Belief. Amen. Belief. It's there. We have to, I could, I've got a whole bunch of scripture. I'm not going to give it to you, but I've got a whole bunch. Every one of them has got it in there about believing. You know, remember what they, they, they approached Jesus one day and they asked him this question. He said, what's the work of God? He said, believe. Just believe. Yeah. Just believe in him who God sent. Just, just believe. Is that all? You know, can, don't, don't, can I do, sweep the floors? Can I do something? You know, just believe. Just believe. So it's critical that we believe. Now, it's more critical that you stop the things that would cause you not to believe. That can be environmental. That can be all kinds of things where we are. That's why I don't go to coffee shops. <laughs> Same reason. Look over at Mark 9, 23. You go to the coffee shop, I mean, you get the answer to everything. Then all they come back and do it again. 9.23. He said, If thou canst believe Jesus did, all things are possible to him that believes. Do you have an issue in your life you need straightened out? Here's your answer. Here's your answer. Well, I'm, yeah, this is your answer. This is, stop. This will cause your, this will cause you to have a marvelous, marvelous Pivot point. So it's important that we believe. Let's go to Luke 850, please. Same issue. Your daughter's dead. He said, Fear not, believe only, and she'll be made whole. They weren't even close to her. He's standing there in the road, you know, said, fear not. Only be made whole. Only believe. Look up 1 Corinthians 2 5 now. I'm going to swamp you with the scriptures. And this is why I'm doing it. 1 Corinthians 2 5. I want to tell you what that meant. <clears throat> Back when I was having trouble with that heart because it was running away with itself, I'd come to church, sit there on the second row, <clears throat> exhausted. All I'd done riding a car down there, exhausted, sitting there, sit there, sit there. Y'all would start worshiping God. <clears throat> and you know how Randy is. I don't think he knows any scripture at all. <clears throat> <laughs> start putting that scripture out, see? And y'all be worshiping in spirit and in truth. And if you remember, I'd sit there for a while, and then the next thing you know, I was standing up. And I was standing up because the Word had begun to work in my life. It wasn't because I was excited. It was because the Word of God had begun to work in my life. It's critically important that we understand that. It's, we got to know that because the life is in the Word of God. The life is in the Word of God. And if we, in, we, if we swamp ourselves with this Word, it can't help but change our life. First Corinthians 2.5, look at this one please. 
My speech, Paul says, and my speech and my preaching was not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of the power, verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom, according to man, of man, but in the power of God. Now, that, that, this is one reason why I was so excited whenever I uh, went to Greece, uh, because I had been uh, muttering and thinking about Mars Hill a long time, a long time. And I really wanted to get there. And I was so happy whenever I was able to see that we could not only see there, but we could walk up Mars Hill. And you had two ways up. You could go around the easy way, which is a gradual incline that they had built for older folks. And then there was another, you'd go straight up to here, straight up in the air. I mean, not really, but pretty close. And in boulders, slick boulders. And, and I just, I could not think about going that way. I needed to go up this way because on Mars Hill, and I don't know why they picked that, but there was a judiciary body that would get on top of this body and they would handle affairs like murder, which is a really important thing to them because that stops other generations from coming along later. It's important to us as well. But they made it, but they, but they contemplated things like murder and also sedition and also uh, sacrilegion, things like that. They, they handled those kinds of things. Well, Paul shows up and he gets up on Mars Hill because he'd come along and he's saying, as he came into town, uh, he's on the lamb. He'd come from some other place. They'd thrown him out of. And he had seen this on the hill, uh, worshiping uh, an unknown God. It's there, up there on that hill. And, uh, and, and that just it bugged him. That got him, you know. So he had to say something about that as he was prone to do. And he talked to them. And so he debated them. He debated with them. Now listen how he did. Now he was totally qualified to be a debater. Uh, he had a great deal of knowledge. In fact, uh, Randy and I talked about this, and we really both believe that, that he was really, before he got born again on the Damascus Road, he was really on his way to becoming the high priest of Israel. That's where he was headed, because he was a zealous person. He was a Pharisee, and he had he was been trained by one of the most illustrious teachers on in the in Gamiel and uh, and and he had the right citizenship he had all that kind of stuff he was headed that way and then he got knocked off his horse there going to Damascus and it changed him entirely but he had all these qualifications to do all these things and so when he went up to debate them I'm sure he was fully confident that he could do this I think he was. I don't think he was ever a shrinking violet and thought, and thought he couldn't do things like this. So he went up there and he debated them on Mars Hill and what he was talking about. He could debate them on the human level and, and quiet down all their objections uh, that he had that you're worshiping an unknown God. I knew he was confident. I feel like he was totally confident that he could do this. Well, he did this. He did all this. And then later on, you read about it in 2 Corinthians where he was up to the foot and he said, henceforth, he had a pivot point. Here's the pivot point. Henceforth, this is the smart Paul. He said, henceforth, I am going to preach Jesus Christ yes. and him crucified. Yes. Zip. That's right. Ah, see what happened? What happened? It sucked it out of him about his own ability, and it got him back to his call, which preached Jesus Christ and him crucified. And he got up there and he realized, hey, I'm out of bounds. This is not correct. So what I'm going to do henceforth is this. It's a pivot point in his life. Because then he went on up to Corinth, and he had great success there. And then the next thing, he had a little trouble, as usual. And then the next thing, he was over in Ephesus, you know over there, and he had a little trouble over there. And, but he's always, what he was doing, standing up for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. And he also had another thing. Uh, there were other things. Uh, uh, don't have, I don't really have time to do this, but I, I wanted to tell you that he was led. It's amazing. I, I've been heavy on just learning about the Holy Spirit and having a fellowship with him. And I've just learned how amazing it was, how he was directed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit told him one time, don't you be preaching, don't you be doing evangelizing over, over in Asia. Well, you say, well, you find why would not? I'd have to do that. But the Holy Spirit, no, don't do that. And so he didn't go there. So he went, he went to, well, I go to Mysia. And he goes up to Mysia. Well, that doesn't work either because the Holy Spirit said, don't, don't speak there. The Holy Spirit directed him again. 
See, see, he's changing all the time. He, it's not the Paul, I know what I'm doing. He's, he's now being led by the Spirit. And the next thing you know, he, he went down to Bethania. But he was looking for what God wanted him to do. And guess what? He got a dream that night and, the, and, and he saw a man in this vision. The man said, had, had his arm outstretched and he said, come help us. And he was at Macedonia. So what did Paul do? Bless God, I'm going to Macedonia. And so then he was led, he was just moved around by God. And the next thing you know, he was in Macedonia. Well, the second thing he did, he got in jail over there, but also he was evangelizing again, where he was always in the forefront, whatever's going on. And so that's his personality. And he went there, and I'll tell you what happened. We are results of that being led by the Spirit then, because right now he went all over to uh, all over all over that part of the country in Asia Minor, and then went over into Europe just as well, and he was evangelizing over there, and we got the results of that work. Got to work that because we, he was led by the Spirit. He decided he was going to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We are a direct result of that having happened. You understand? You know? Because he saw the pivot point and then he said, Henceforth, I'm just going to preach to the Gentiles. Well, God had told him that earlier. He told him that earlier. And finally, after all the shellacking he took and all these things and all these pivot points in life, he said, he just, he just shaked the dust off his feet from these people and henceforth. And it said after that, that the Greeks heard him and the other folks, the Jews heard him. And he said he received a lot of benefit. They received a lot of blessing from him. And he got many of them born again and filled with the Spirit. And filled with the Spirit because he was doing what God wanted him to after all. Everybody pointed him around and finally got him there. Will that work today? Yes. Well, yes. Absolutely. In fact, it's necessary. It's necessary. It's important that we do it that way. This days of being a Lone Ranger are long over. Yeah. Long over. I saw that happen in the 40s and the 50s and 60s. And, and, and I thought that was the way it's supposed to be. But now it makes me sick. Think about that. We are to be led by the Spirit of God because He knows. And we don't. He's got the power. All we're doing is borrowing it. And it begins to work that way. So that begins to work in our lives. And we can look for pivot points in our life and it'll begin to happen just the way it did in those times. Back, let me give you, a, let me, give me a little time. I, I, I've got some things that I really need to talk to you about here. Uh, one of the first pivot points that we'll recognize is one of Adam. That's over in Genesis 1st chapter 27th and 28th verses. We'll go there just a minute. I'll just, I won't talk about it long. I'll just, just kick it out. If you'll remember, God said, I'm going to create man in my image, in our image. In the image of God created him, man. And he said in verse 28, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moved upon the earth. Do you hear that? Yes. Satan was a living thing. He was. Adam didn't do what God said do. He was a living thing. Okay. And then God said, Behold, I gave you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth and every tree in which is the fruit of a, a tree yielding seed to you and it shall be me. You're going to garden this place. So what happened whenever they made a mistake? They listened to the wrong person and they ended up losing control. He gave them dominion over this place and they lost dominion over it. They didn't lose heaven. They never were designed for heaven. They were designed to control this place. They lost it. He didn't take care of his gardening. Later on, you'll find on that whenever Mary Magdalene was, uh, was she turned and look, she mistook Jesus for the gardener. Really? Now, let me tell you. Now, just let me tell you. From the old law unto the law of grace, to grace, everything has changed. It's critically important that we understand that. Many people have, have decided to be saved by the grace of God, but then decide they're going to live out the rest of their life by the laws of God. Really? Yeah, yeah. And so what they do then, say, well, why? Uh, let me give you one. You may not like this one, but I'll tell you what. The Ten Commandments were given by a, were given by a man born under the law, and, taught, and he was given out to people who were under the law, that's true, isn't it? 
Okay, and then what happened? Then, then later on, he got born again and resurrected again, and those laws don't apply anymore. You know what law applies anymore? It says, love, let's love all love each other and believe. Those are the two. Those were the two. Those are the ones that we have now. And that's all we need, actually. And so what now? Jesus became the gardener which Adam let go. Under the new covenant, he replaced it all just as well. That's not all. See what happens then. And Jesus also, remember whenever he was in the, I'm, I'm going to rush this out. So whenever Jesus met John in the, in the Jordan River, you ought to study all the things that happened in the Jordan River. Whenever he met him in the Jordan River, it was said at the time that John the Baptist had to, he said myself, I have to decrease so he can increase. Who was John the Baptist? He was of the Levite priesthood. Who's Jesus? I'm telling I'm show you the difference. What's going on now? Jesus, you remember, you remember Adam? I mean, Abraham? Whenever he gave his tithes to that strange priest that met him after he won that war, it was Melchizedek. Remember that? And he gave his offering to him. Must have been millions of dollars. He, he gave him, he gave him offering of all of his assets to this guy that's walking down the road named Melchizedek. What's it say about Jesus? That he's on the order of Melchizedek. What's it say about Jesus just as well? He said, it's got a new priesthood going on here now. This new priesthood is not of the Levitical uh, lineage, what it is now. It, Jesus, you know, was from Judah. He wasn't the Levite at all. So what's happened? There's a change that's taking place. There's a change breaking down. And now what we've got is the new order going on. We've got a new priest now. We've got a new priest. And he says, it's going to be, my, this is our high priest now. It's not by the law. It's by grace. It's by grace now. It's going to work now. It's by, God, by grace now. What, what was the law like? We had to do it. We had to do it so we could maybe get approval of God later. What's the new thing say? He's going to approve us first. Really? Yeah, he's going to approve us first. And then we just love him and he leads us into paths of righteousness. He, he loves us so much. He, he says, you're the, you're the righteousness of God in Christ before you had any right to be. Right. What happened under the law? He said, no, you try it and we'll see if you're going to make it. Well, they didn't make it. They didn't make it. So the law would keep you that bound, but the law, but the, but the Jesus, but the, 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 the grace that we're talking about now lifts you up, lifts you up. When Jesus came, he came, did he come to save, save the Christians? Not at all. He came to save people, came to save people who were against him. Jesus was mistreated by people who were closest to him. You know, the night whenever he had, uh, whenever he, uh, uh, of the uh, upper room supper that he had for them, one of them left him that night. And then the 11, the other, the other 11, he lost them by daylight. So they, you know, and he came to save those guys. And he came to save us as well. What did we start off as? Sinners? Sinners? I'd like to save people that love me. You know, it's me, you know. That's not what he did. He saved people. He's on the job of saving people who hated him. Just as well. Did it work the way? Okay, whenever Joshua, I'm going to give you this. Whenever Joshua decided to uh, go into Canaan land, here's what happened. You remember that? They said, whenever, you st whenever the priests step into the water, do you remember this? Step into the water. Said the water's stacked up in a heap. Remember that phrase there? And rolled all the way back to the city of Adam. Remember that? What's significant about that? Whenever, why was this? First thing I need to point out to you that that was the mercy seat going into the water. Mercy seat. Who's, who's the mercy seat guy? Jesus, and I'll prove it to you in a minute. So they did that, and all the water heaped up and went back to the city of, of, of Adam. Why? Because we had, to, we had to roll back all of the sins of the people back to Adam. Oh, really? Yeah, roll them all the way back and then they come down by, because the mercy seat changed the deal. Why do I say Jesus is the mercy seat? Whenever Jesus, whenever Mary went and looked into the tomb that the sepulchre that day, she looked in there and she saw after the boys came and left. By the way, she was the apostle to the apostle because she went to get them, you know, and tell them, hey, you know, stones rolled away. Master's gone. 
So they came looking, yeah, they left. So then she was there, and she looked in there, and guess what she saw? She saw an angel on one end of where Jesus had laid, and she saw an angel on the other end of where the angel. Now, what's significant about that? Well, under the old covenant, under the old law, they had the mercy seat there, and they had the cherubims on either, either side, and they, were, and they were the cherubs of death. If you touch that thing, it'd kill you. Remember that? And so they were there, and so they were there to dish out death. And so what now we're looking in there and we see there's an angel on one end of that and there's an angel on the other end of that mercy seat. And what are they there for? To bless you. They're there to bless you. So we're under that kind of covenant now. Why are we trying to live under the old covenant? Just as well. And so, that, so that's a mercy seat there. And what was under the mercy seat? Three things that, that people had messed up. Aaron's rod. They didn't believe in the authority. They objected to his authority. The, the pot of manna, they objected to his provision. And the two tablets, they objected to his laws. So what happened is, put them in there, put the lid on them, Jesus with the mercy seat for that, so that you couldn't see that anymore. So that's what's happened now. We don't have to go by the old law. Amen. It's changed, it's a change, it's a change, it's a change deal. It's a changed deal. So when the mercy seat went in the Jordan, it heaped up like that. The sins were eradicated. And now comes down the blessing of mercy. We've got to have grace, but we also have to have mercy. Yeah. Just as well. So that begins to work for us. The other things I can talk to you about, about Jordan, but I won't tonight because I'm out of time. And I want to tell you, however, that the, that the point that we need to make is that we need a fresh revelation of Jesus Christ in our life. We need a fresh revelation. If we, if, there, if we do have a fresh revelation of Jesus, there's nothing, there's nothing that the revelation can't fix for us. There's nothing that it can't fix. I have experienced that in my life. I could not understand certain scriptures until I got a revelation of them. And when I got a revelation of them, that quickly cleared up. So God, I need a revelation. He said, stay with me, son. Stay with me, son. I'll give you revelation as you begin to study my word. And so that's beginning to happen. I'm seeing that more all the time. It's just being illuminated more. So the job to do is to get a revelation of the Word. It's not just study the Word for the mental side. It's to get a revelation of the Word. How are you going to get that? Out of the Holy Spirit. Out of the Holy Spirit. Out of the Holy Spirit. Will He lead you? Oh, yeah. Do we want Him to lead us? Oh, yeah. Tired of making mistakes? Oh, yeah. Just, will He do it? Yeah, He'll do it. And I'll say to you tonight, if you want to spiritually progress, in God's Word. Go by the Word, but believe Him for the progress. You believe Him that he's, it's going to happen for you instead of, well, maybe it will, maybe it won't. How many years have you wasted that way? If you like me, a bunch. I like me a bunch. I'm just going to see if it's going to happen. That's not faith at all. There's not anything about that that's faith. But what we can begin to do, Randy talks about faith a lot, what we can begin to do is to faith for the things we need. And I'll tell you one more thing as I quit. We sh everything we should do, we should be doing as the body of Christ. Amen. Don't ever step away from, I'm just going to do this. No, don't do it. Do this as the body of Christ would do it. And you remember, if you know Jesus Christ, you remember, and it will work for you. It'll work for you. It will work for you. The Lord needs a victorious church. He needs a victorious body of people Amen. like never before, you know. But we've got them in us. He's got them. I look at you now and I can see great potential. I see great potential because of the Word of God. Amen. I don't know about your talent level. I have no idea. But it doesn't really make any difference. It doesn't really make any difference. If you've got Jesus in your life and you've got a revelation of the Lord, it'll work for you. Amen. May I pray for you now. Father, we thank you that we, you've given us your word by which we can have victory in Jesus. You've given us, Lord, a fresh revelation of what's in our life, that we can, we're going to believe in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to the point that we're going to realize all the things that happened because of that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That we're going to be anointed to do your will and your work because that's just who you are. We thank you, Father, that you're going to bless the word that you're going to re remind people of the word that will affect them. And we thank you, Father, that it's going to be good because we planted the seed that is a life seed of God. Thank you, Lord, that you're going to bless us and that it's just going to be that way in Jesus' name. Amen.